Good afternoon. There's a very interesting statement here in Joel's chapter, No End. It's about dehypnotizing. If we can be made to believe that there is a mortal material universe we too are part of this hypnotism if we can be made to believe there is a mortal material universe we are part of the hypnotism so he's saying that only in a state of hypnotism do we believe there is a mortal material universe and that when we are dehypnotized we will know that there is no mortal material universe now there are four different healings of blindness in the Bible and therefore we can look at them with the idea that they are presenting to us different degrees of hypnotism in which individuals symbolic of the entire human race believe there is a mortal material universe and these different healings of blindness then would be stages or degrees of lifting the hypnotism and under the visible pretense of merely healing blindness there must be keys to lift us from our blindness to spirit these must be keys to illumination and so let's look at all four healings at one time to see the similarities and the differences in degrees of the blindness of the human mind we look first at the one at Matthew I think we'll read them all together so that we can see how they compare the first one is in Matthew Matthew 9 there's just a few verses 27 to 30 remember where they take place because the place is often indicative of a degree of consciousness this one takes place in Capernaum I believe when Jesus departed thence two blind men followed him crying and saying thou son of David have mercy on us two blind men thou son of David have mercy on us remember they followed him and you remember that means that they were coming to an inner understanding of the presence of Christ's identity they followed him the master had said deny thyself pick up thy cross and follow me they weren't sitting and begging they were actively following Christ within where were they seeking their healing of Christ within they were asking Christ they were turning to source now as long as we have human fathers and human mothers we go to them when we have a divine father we go to the divine father when you have accepted spiritual fatherhood you seek the spiritual source for your good you go to the father within that's the importance of having a spiritual father that you will turn to that father within and this is what they're doing 
And when he had come to the house, the blind man came to him. The blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye. Believe ye has to precede a healing. Believe ye that I am able to do this. In other words, is there within the individual the acceptance of a spiritual source? Do you believe that you are the offspring, the expression of spirit? Do you believe that spirit is your identity? Believe ye that I can do this. Now these men are blind. How many blind people in this world would go to an individual and say to that individual, open our eyes. Only those who believe in the power of spirit. Only those who have some inborn understanding of their own spiritual identity. Only those perhaps who know that spirit has never made a mistake. There are no errors in spirit. Being lifted out of material consciousness would be the alleviation of blindness. <coughs> the belief then in the presence of spirit and the perfection of spirit is implicit in the statement, do you believe that I can do this and I of course is not Jesus do you believe that spirit in you is perfect no that's a rather simple distillation of all the truth we've learned that spirit in you is perfect now And beside spirit in you, there is no other. Once we have come that far, we can see blindness as a state of mind rather than a state of body. The body be merely being a reflection of the state of mind. In fact, every healing reveals states of mind. What we call adultery turns out to be the adulterous state of the mind which beholds what is called adultery. Those beholding adultery are beholding the adulterous state of their own mind. Those beholding disease are beholding the diseased state of their own mind. Those beholding limitation are beholding the limited state of their own mind. Always the outer picture is the fabric of the mind that beholds it. Those who are in blindness are beholding the blindness of their mind to their soul. Are those who can see blind to their soul? Just as much. There are different degrees of blindness to the soul. All of mortality is now revealed as blindness to the soul. Mortality is blindness. Mortality is a state of blindness, and this is the purpose of the blind healings. To reveal that mortality is a state of blindness. And you will find as you slowly review all the healings in the Bible that Jesus Christ was not healing an individual of a thing or a condition but was healing the human race of its belief in mortality. He was healing one thing, mortality. That's the only disease there is. It's the only problem there is. It's the summary of all his work 
to heal mankind of the false belief in mortality. Little signposts along the road, different diseases, different problems, always raising the dead, raising the mortal from the false sense of mortality. Christ in you then says to the blind mind of you, do you believe that I can reveal to you the kingdom of God? Do you believe that I can reveal to you that there are no conditions unlike the perfection of God? Always Christ in you is speaking and the outer appearance of a blind man is always the mind of you which is blind to that Christ until something in you says yes I believe you can show me these things and now Christ in you takes you out of a human mind Christ in you transfers you from the human mind to the Christ mind the lack the limitation the conditions are in the fabric of the human mind seemingly objectified but there is only one mind the perfect mind of God Christ in you lifts you out of your thought your conditions your beliefs your sense of mind which outpictures a world of matter your sense of mind which is the blind man totally hypnotized and then opens you to the mind of God in you which now reveals to you there was no lack it was a lack in your limited state of consciousness there was no death it was a death in your limited state of consciousness there was no heart attack It was an attack in your limited state of consciousness. And every flaw in our human sense of life we discover to be only a flaw in the mind that still believes in itself and has not dissolved itself to rest in the one perfect mind. In your contemplation, when you rest in the one perfect mind there is an acceptance that God being here the mind of God is here it is perfect you know that every human image is a projection of the world mind and you know that the divine image must therefore be a projection of the divine mind the you man the shadow man the you of a man is not the divine man it is the shadow image from the world mind and in our human mind we come into that circuit in which the human image is accepted as a person an individual but it's never a divine image and because it's only an image perceived by the mind of man it contains all of the flaws in that mind all of the conditions all of the beliefs that fabric is transferred to the objectified image called man and so you rest knowing that there is another image present an image in the divine mind which has no flaws because there are no flaws in the divine mind and your contemplation is merely that here is the one perfect mind of God there is no other mind I rest that mind the mind that has been blind to the one perfect mind and that releases all of the conditions in that mind which is showing forth in the outer image called the you man 
the shadow man, the you man image. Your contemplation lifts you into the one perfect mind. It's a slow process, a quiet process, but it's a renewing process. And this constant renewal, this constant reminder that the one perfect mind is here, means that it must be projecting its own perfect divine image, which is the self of every one. This fact can never be pushed aside, even by the blind human mind. The kingdom can never be removed by man's unawareness of its presence. Our blindness to the invisible kingdom here doesn't remove that kingdom. It merely shuts us off from the enjoyment of it. One perfect mind now, and slowly that permeates your consciousness until you find you are not thinking with your mind. You're letting that perfect mind be your mind. So that your mind will express that perfect mind as a one continuous expression. And whatever is thought in the divine mind will become thought in the mind you call your mind. It will be one thought continuing to express, projecting its own perfection into consciousness. It removes the illusion that is in the fabric of the limited human mind. It removes the sense of a heart attack. It brings light. It enlightens. And that light brings with it the end of the material sense of consciousness, the dream consciousness. The light removes the darkness of the dream consciousness. And as you rest in one with the perfect mind, it reveals very quietly the present perfection of the invisible. <coughs> there are no counter thoughts, no opposing thoughts, no troubled thoughts, no human thoughts, just the one divine mind being itself, governing all within itself without a second. Without realizing it, the second self of you disappears. The one self of you expresses without a second. It comes forth as an improvement in the human scene because layers of false mentality are wiped away. The dream consciousness is broken. You awaken from the dream of a human self, a human mind, a mortal being. And though you are not aware that you have done all this, it has been done for you. And you say, oh, I feel so much more at peace. Every time you become conscious that the one perfect mind is where you are and you rest in it, yield to it, accept it, trust it, 
believe that it can do this for you it will always your faith in the one perfect mind being present will be confirmed by your experience you will find renewed vigor renewed understanding renewed health renewed courage and a deeper awareness that there is an infinite power ever present no matter what the outer objectified condition presents to the mind that is blind for that condition and the blind mind are one and the same you are looking at the thoughts in your blind mind accepting them as outer reality reacting to them and then being forced into a series of reactions culminating in a final action which is completely based upon the acceptance of that which is not there but in the one mind lived in the whole pyramid of reaction to error that is not there is removed we are not committed we do not let the hand and the eye fool us we do not let the jailer take us and cast us into prison we do not remain in the prison of the mind we do not serve a sentence there we remain free of the idols of the mind even of blindness this is a complete condition a condition such as few people on earth suffer from comparatively and therefore it includes just about every condition we can undergo as human beings blindness here then is the total state of the mortal mind it is blind to Christ it is anti-self it is hypnotized but divine mind is present you need not rest in human mind do you believe that I Christ mind divine mind can open your eyes yes we believe say the two blind men you may remember last week it was noted that the two blind men stand for the faith and the will the faith that spirit is present and the will to live in that spirit as spiritual identity these two more two or more gathered in my name and there am I the Christ mind in the midst of them doing the work of the Father when your faith and your will in spirit are united I in the midst of you can show the glories of old even to the miracle of opening the eyes to the vision of the soul every human ailment is included in this simple statement here by the master do you believe I can do these things do you believe you are spirit do you believe God is your father do you believe your father is here now do you believe your father has all power to maintain the perfection of his child 
of his offspring, of his creation. Yes, I believe all this. Then you're not sick. You're well. The sickness was the illusion of the mind that did not believe this, but had another father, another creation, another source, another identity. If you believe these things, you're not sick. But if you're still sick, then you do not believe these things. And so we adjust the consciousness, deepen the understanding, reach that acceptance level which can say, I have faith in the allness of spirit, the presence of spirit, the omnipotence of spirit to maintain a perfect spiritual creation and there is no other and there you stand letting the false objectivization of the false mind dissolve itself the new light removes the old darkness you're standing still in identity in the one perfect mind which is ever-present awaiting acknowledgement. And you are healed of the false belief in material, mortal selfhood. Their response to him when he said, Do you believe? Yes, yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And this was their release to the one perfect mind. The human mind was out of the way by faith in the presence of the Spirit of God and the will to live in and as that Spirit. And this is the meaning of he touched their eyes. The Christ mind sent light to the mind which had yielded its authority to the one perfect mind. The light of the one mind expresses as the vision, the knowing of that one mind. The inner spiritual awakening which now becomes vision is also the inner spiritual awakening which becomes the realization of Christ identity the realization of divine sonship illumination the consciousness of the Christ universe around us as our own one selfhood Now this happened in Capernaum. Their eyes were open. Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. Capernaum then is a state of transformation. Whenever Jesus goes down to Capernaum or up to Capernaum, usually up or into Capernaum will indicate then a level of transformation taking place. Transformation of consciousness from my human mind to the acceptance of the one perfect mind present, which outpictures perfection only, and therefore all that can be here is perfection because the one perfect mind is here. The false idols of the human mind will see the imperfections that are within that human mind. But when I am transferred from that human mind and its beliefs to the purity of the one perfect mind accepted, then all of the beliefs of the false, limited human mind are recognized as 
just externalizations of the fabric of mortal mind. Never true, never created by the Father. No blindness created by the Father, no lack, no limitation, no lifespans either. What we have called birth and death and the interim between are merely periods of soul development, terms of development of the soul, which the mind sees and cannot embrace in the fullness of them. Now that's one healing. The union of faith and will to live in and accept the presence of the one perfect mind. Another healing takes place in Bethsaida. Another healing takes place in Jericho. And then the healing in John, which we're still to do today, is in Jerusalem. And so Capernaum, Bethsaida, Jericho, Jerusalem. Now Bethsaida is a fishing village. So it's the beginning of the teaching to the initiate, the little fish. not a healing of a blind man that's just the outer appearance it's an introduction to the inner initiation of the spirit and then in Jericho after the man in Bethsaida is prepared we come to Jericho the moon city the city of the senses and there that which is prepared in Bethsaida for the initiate comes to a higher degree of attainment as the sense consciousness is dispelled. In short, these healings are initiation keys. Finally, in Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, is another healing showing Christ consciousness attained or the release from blindness or mortality let's look at the one in Mark this one is at uh, 822 again it's a short one 822 This would be the one in Bethsaida, of the fishing village. And he cometh to Bethsaida, to bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. They bring to him a blind man. blind man is being lifted into an inner awareness of Christ they want him to touch him they think the physical touch will do it we know he will touch him by Christ awareness within the Christ mind will come through that will be the touch He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town, out of the old consciousness, out of the belief that I am a human being in a material world, out of the belief that this body made of flesh is me, out of town, out of world thought, out of the prevailing atmosphere of thought which saw this as a blind man this is the preparation of the initiate into a higher level which will culminate as Christ consciousness spirit I am 
when he'd spit in his eye, on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked if he saw aright. He looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. That's a very strange statement for us because when you are in the acceptance of spirit, then a man and a tree are much the same. Both are material. You're not accepting life. You're accepting only the material appearances without giving them a sense of life. You're not saying the man is alive, the man is a divine creation, and the tree is a divine creation. You're seeing them as images. And one image is the same as another. This one is a tree image, that is a man image. Trees like men walking. Men like trees. It passed a state in this semi-state of accepting them as reality. the beginning of the understanding that there is one fabric making both a man and a tree and that's world mind not God mind world mind the limited human mind becomes part of that acceptance of tree and man which is you of a man you of a tree they're not seeing the spiritual man or the spiritual tree which is a human condition. And finally, after he put his hands again upon his eyes, made him look up, he was restored and saw every man clearly. Now he could see the one invisible self as the self of all. He had been dehypnotized. Again, the healings in the Bible are all dehypnosis. Instead of healing a man's ear or eye or teeth or body of a condition, the mind of the man was released from its false concept and the truth of the one perfect mind was revealed as the only present truth there. Dehypnosis was followed by the revelation of a perfected image. An image that had always been perfect, but was blocked by the false sense of the material conscious mind. Dehypnosis from the sense of mortality shows forth as what the world calls healing. Always, the perfect is present in the perfect mind that is present and blocked from our experience by the sense of my mind, your mind, his mind, where no such minds really exist. He said, neither go into town nor tell it to any in the town. Stay out of mortal mind. Don't fall back into a human mind. Now in Mark again, this is 1046. Looks like we have a Chinese convention outside. I thought by now they'd pass, but they're staying. Now we come to Jericho, 1046. Each time so far, we have seen a false state of mind removed and a healing took place. I, Christ, became the mind of the first two blind men. I, Christ, became the mind of the second blind man. 
I, Christ, will always become the mind of the one who says, I am healed. I, Christ, becomes the mind of you, me, him, her, and we say, where did my problems go? Because I, Christ, can only objectify the divine image. I, Christ, is never blind to God. <coughs> Come to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people blind, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Sat begging. When it says they sat, that means spiritually they're stagnant. When it says they're begging, it means they're not sufficient in Christ, not self-sufficient. Begging always is a state of insufficiency in mortality. When the beggar receives Christ, he no longer sits, he usually leaps up, and he no longer begs because he's now self-sufficient in Christ. And so sat begging is a state of mortal mind in which we feel we're missing something, we lack something, and it's because we're sitting, we're stagnant, we're not open to the flow of the one perfect mind. And so we sit, begging, aware of our limitations and our wounds, whereas right there, present in the one perfect mind, is the perfect self, waiting to be lived in if we will step out of the belief that this mind of mine is a true state of mind. Forget the condition. It is only an objectivization of a mind that is not a true state of mind. Rest in the one perfect mind. And lo and behold, from the mountaintop of truth, Truth reveals itself and sets you free. Always the one perfect mind is present. I can never leave you. I, the divine mind, am wherever you are. Rest in me. Acknowledge me with faith that I am present. with the will not to fall back into a second mind, a second self, a second life, and I will open your eyes. No longer will you be on the highway begging, needing, wanting, seeking, striving, for I reveal the finished kingdom where you are. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he begged, began to cry, and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. This is the acceptance of Christ within turning to source, resting in the one perfect mind. Jesus stood still. And commanded him to be called. They called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And now the mind that was pleading, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, begins to accept. It doesn't have to plead anymore. It simply has to rise to accept. Why, what am I pleading for? The Christ mind is my own mind. The one perfect mind here is the only mind there is. 
All I have to do is get out of my mind, which wanted to plead. And I accept this one perfect mind here is the perfect expression of God. You rise to that level and rest. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Your garment, then, that you cast away is the mind which had separated you from the one perfect mind, the hypnotized or dream mind of man, with its complete world conditions. That garment you cast aside in another place is called rolling away the stone. Here is called casting aside the garment. And when you realize that the entire field of psychology is probing that one mind which is unaware of the one perfect mind, then it must be seen that all psychology is still working within the dream consciousness. That's why there's no hope in it. It cannot release the dream. It changes from one dream to another. It changes from a mind that is doing something bad to a mind that is doing something better, but is still a mortal mind. Again, psychology has introduced to us the idea of the unconscious. Somebody gave me a book on it the other day, and I was very surprised to see that the author of this particular talk, usually, in order to include God in the conversation, would say, whether you call it God or the unconscious. And therefore, it was the author's belief that what we call God was really not God, but was the unconscious. Now, that is true about religions. What religions call God is the unconscious but they don't know it's the unconscious but the Christ teaching doesn't call God what psychology calls the unconscious religions do but not Christ what psychology has discovered to be the unconscious which is what religions call God both are the identical mortal mind the unconscious is the unconscious mortal mind or the universal world mind, which is the unconscious of man. And it's also what religions worship and call God. But whenever you hear that unconscious, you're hearing about the universal world mind. And Christ took us beyond the universal world mind. Christ took us beyond the unconscious because God is not unconscious. Christ took us to God. The minute you say God or the unconscious, you're saying that God is unconscious, which means only one thing, that you are unconscious. Because the mind that is asleep in the dream is unconscious of God. Unconscious of the one perfect infinite mind ever present. And that one perfect infinite mind ever present is the only God there is. It is not the unconscious of man. That's the counterfeit world mind, which is the unconscious of man, which is being probed by psychology. You probe the counterfeit world mind and think you've got something, and you're stuck for life. You're imprisoned in a fable. And so man draws from this vast reservoir of nothing and gets nothing. He draws from the world dream and makes it an individual dream. 
Christ took us right through that out of that blindness out of the blindness of psychology and religion out of the blindness of material medica out of all of the blindness of the world mind which becomes the individual human sense of mind out of mortality now in this third healing here you have a man being taken out of a sense mind sense consciousness he is removed from the unconscious which had been making him blind nobody probed the unconscious they removed him from it and so we come finally to the fourth healing now these were states in initiation preparation purification attainment of higher levels Jerusalem where the temple was was a very specifically chosen place for one reason naturally you'd expect religion to heal and it would heal in its temples but here's a healing outside the temple terrible thing of course because once you heal outside the temple who's going to have to go inside the temple and that was the reason for the outrage how can you heal outside our temple it's impossible you must be a faker but the message for us is the kingdom of God is within you you don't get your healing in a church you get your healing in the one perfect mind of the father which reveals perfection on the holy ground where you stand and so you don't have to petition the church to say heal me you don't have to tithe you don't have to grovel you don't have to say have mercy on me you don't have to plead you simply have to be aware that the one perfect mind of God is present and you're in church that's your temple and then you don't need materia medica you don't need psychology you don't need metaphysics you don't need any one on this earth why because the one perfect mind where you are is forever perfect forever maintaining its perfect creation now because the mind of man will not accept this we don't argue with the mind of man the condition of that mind is that it's enslaved to its own beliefs to its own limited experiences it will do such strange things as turn upon the perfect mind of the father and accuse it of being a faker and here it will call the beggar a sinner it will tell him that he's outright a liar where does he get off trying to pull the wool over their eyes and saying that he was blind from birth where does he get off saying that he was in the street somewhere outside the temple and a man healed him of blindness and where do his parents get off saying that this happened who ever heard of such a thing and so finally it's revealed that the real blindness is not the blind man whose eyes are open but the mind of man which refuses to acknowledge that it happened or that it's possible that mind being committed to the fact that you must come into a place called a temple 
You must come and worship in that temple. You must do many things. And always behind this was the idea that the blind man, of course, was that way because of divine punishment. How could the punishment be removed so quickly and for what? He had shown no atonements. He hadn't repented. He hadn't done anything to say that he was sorry for whatever he had done. The divine punishment hadn't been removed. How could he have been healed of it? And so obviously the man who healed him was a faker. And he was probably a faker himself for pretending all these years that he was blind. Now we say, how could the Pharisees be so stupid? But he's not talking about Pharisees. He's talking about your mind and my mind. The human mind, which thwarted at one turn, will shift to another. He's telling us that the human mind is conditioned to self-deception. You would have thought that the Hebrews in that day were seeking the salvation of man. But here it's being shown that even though that's what we thought the human mind was seeking, it is not capable of seeking that. All the human mind is capable of seeking is its own self-justification, its own self-righteousness. Whatever your human mind feels is right, that's what you're willing to fight to protect. And you may be under the illusion that you're willing to let go of your conditioned beliefs if some better beliefs come along. But if they directly contradict your way of life, your committed opinions, you have no capacity to go outside of those and in some way or other your mind tries to justify itself for doing it this way. He's revealing an innate quality of the human mind that even in the face of the evidence of blindness healed, it would not accept it because as far as it knew, blindness can only be healed by God lifting the punishment that it caused the blindness in the first place. And certainly no one who wasn't in the temple could be chosen by God. So conditioned is the mind that it can only see what it knows. Always, of course, behind this is to break down our faith in the mind of man and build up our faith in the mind of God. Once we know that the human mind, even in us, in ourselves, is so built that it has no capacity to see outside of its own knowledge and that its knowledge is inevitably separated from God mind, being, matter cannot perceive spirit this is a permanent condition of the human mind and when we recognize this permanent fallacy of the mind we won't try to circumvent this knowledge by saying well my mind is different we will accept it as a condition of the human mind which we can never overcome except by releasing that mind the pool of Siloam was mentioned before in the Bible in a different way you remember the story of Naaman the leper? You find it in 2 Kings chapter 5. He was a captain in the Syrian army. He was a victorious warrior, very important to his king. But he also had leprosy. And so his king said, Well, I hear from someone who works for your own wife, a maid there, a maid servant." She tells us that in Samaria, in the kingdom of Israel, that's when Samaria was still part of that kingdom, that they have a prophet there, and he can heal you of leprosy. And so, because you're important to me, I'm going to send you to that king and tell him to have you healed. 
So the king of Syria wrote the king of Israel. And he said, I have this great warrior here. I'm going to send him down there and I want you to see that he gets healed of his leprosy. Of course, there'll be a lot of transferring of gold and silver and all the accoutrements that go with that kind of a, a royal contract. So the king of Israel said, well now, whatever got into this man's mind? I don't know anything about healing anybody. Who does he think I am, God? And he was about to rip up this letter from the king of Syria when Elisha said, why don't you have that warrior come down so they can see there's a prophet in Israel? So Naaman came down. He had a chariot drawn by horses. He had his servants with him. He was an important man. And he expected to be greeted by an important man who would look up to the heavens and make some great declaration, maybe slap Naaman on the forehead and say, you're well. What happened? A messenger came out. The messenger said, I have a message from Elisha. He says, for you to go and dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. And when you do, You'll be all free of your leprosy. This wasn't at all what the human mind expected. So Naaman was very angry. He hadn't had a royal welcome. It hadn't happened at all as he had expected. Besides, back in Damascus, they had their own water. A couple of rivers there he felt were at least as good as the Jordan. And so he started home, very angrily. But his servants prevailed upon him and said, Now what have you got to lose? He made this trip. <coughs> Surely the man who gave this message to you had something in mind. Why don't you obey? 